On this Sunday night, the vaccination push in Canada. More shots on order, but Canadians are still waiting. Obviously, uh, it's not going as fast as, uh, as everyone would want. Why is Canada still playing catch up compared to other countries, foreign policy and Saudi Arabia? Is Saudi Arabia an ally of, to Canada? Uh, no. How two allies are finding common ground on the kingdom. The water crisis in First Nations communities. There's no consequences for that. The government isn't penalizing. Accusations of shoddy infrastructure projects. Plus, the Serb and tax season. It was not free money. What you need to know to prepare your return. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Prime Minister is facing more scrutiny over the country's vaccine rollout. Today, he appeared on a U.S. political talk show where he once again insisted millions of Canadians will have the opportunity to be inoculated. On Friday, Health Canada approved the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and it will boost Canada's capacity to immunize more people. That's once the shipments begin arriving. But that's little relief to people in parts of this country facing rising case numbers. Global Sean O'Shea reports. The push to vaccinate Canadians against COVID-19 now includes those in one of the highest risk populations in Canada's largest city, the homeless. It's too late, but uh, really glad that it's actually happening. Toronto will give 7,000 people who live in shelters priority to receive vaccines. Residents will begin getting their first shots this week. Prioritizing this group for vaccination is, is good public health and it's just the right thing to do. Cities across Canada are mobilizing to vaccinate as many residents as they can. In Montreal, this converted arena becomes a full-time vaccination center on Monday. The staff is geared up to give 1,500 shots a day. It affects um, our employees, our families, our neighbours. So it's, uh, it's very important to us. 85-year-old Ronald Yeoman is ready for his turn. To me, to get vaccinated is right. The problem across the country isn't a lack of interest, it's a shortage of supply. Only 3.5% of Canadians have received at least one dose of the vaccine, while in the United States, more than 7% of the population is fully vaccinated. The government says it is setting what it calls realistic targets. If we achieve our goal of every Canadian having access to immunization, to vaccination uh, earlier than uh, the end of September, that's good news. Just approved last Friday, the first half million doses of AstraZeneca's vaccine will arrive in Canada from India this week. Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is still awaiting the go-ahead from Canadian regulators. It's nice to have good news from time to time, but we must remember that our uh, precautions, um, both as individuals and our public health interventions, are really important. Those ready to give out the vaccines are upbeat. We see hope. So uh, we can't wait. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Toronto. Israel is the envy of much of the world when it comes to its vaccination campaign. More than half of all Israeli citizens have received at least one dose. The country has now rolled out a vaccine certificate system, which allows those who have received both shots to go to gyms, restaurants and cultural events. But is it an idea that could catch on in Canada? Redmond Shannon takes a look at the benefits and challenges. Remember live music? It's no longer a fond memory in Israel, partly down to its super high-speed COVID-19 vaccine rollout. This is great because it's, uh, it's been a long time that we didn't go out of the house. No one is more pumped than Benjamin Netanyahu. As the Israeli Prime Minister campaigns for yet another election, he shows off the Green Badge app. It will allow anyone who's had two vaccine doses or who has recovered from the virus to go to non-essential venues like gyms and cultural events, and possibly in the future to travel internationally. There is a precedent. Some countries require a yellow fever vaccine certificate for entry. A similar system is possible for COVID travel, according to the bioethicist Francoise Bayliss. We will have vaccine certificates. It would be irresponsible of public health not to generate vaccine certificates. The critical thing is what are they used for? And how can the health data be securely managed? Obviously, the downside of this is privacy and patient confidentiality and so forth. And I think we're going to see this tension play out. I think people you know, may be more open to this type of intrusion 
than they have in the past because of the impact of the pandemic. Other issues include the differing efficacies of vaccines and how exactly COVID-19 immunity is defined. We're still missing information about transmissibility. We now have these new variants and it's turning out that certain vaccines are not as effective or are probably ineffective against certain variants. Quebec is considering vaccine passports and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau won't rule out supporting them across Canada. We'll continue uh, to pay close attention to the recommendations that uh, our experts make in terms of uh, measures like that. There are concerns these certificates could lead to a two-tiered society where businesses could turn away the non-vaccinated. Why should we assume that the private sector should be in control of any of this? And I think that that's actually right now a very serious discussion and debate around the world. Bayliss says in the race to return to some semblance of normalcy, we need to remember whose rights might get left behind. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Facing mounting pressure to take a tough stance against Saudi Arabia, U.S. President Joe Biden says he will make a major announcement tomorrow. At issue is the intelligence report showing Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman approved the assassination of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Today, Canada's Prime Minister called for an international effort to stop human rights abuses. But as Jennifer Johnson reports, the region is key for both nations. U.S. President Joe Biden plans to break his silence on Saudi Arabia after an intelligence report found the crown prince and next in line to be king signed off on the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. There'll be announcements on Monday of what we're going to be doing with, with Saudi Arabia. Khashoggi was last seen alive entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, where he was killed and dismembered, according to U.S. and U.N. investigators. Congress passed a law in 2019 demanding President Donald Trump release the CIA report. But Trump, who's had a close relationship with the kingdom, refused. Now some lawmakers want the man on top punished. It's a day of reckoning, but one that is long overdue. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said Sunday, Canada has consistently condemned human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia. Canada froze all new arms sales to the kingdom shortly after Khashoggi's murder, but the ban was lifted last year. Is Saudi Arabia an ally of, to Canada? Uh, no, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it. They're a, they're a country we do business with. They're a country that we continually advocate for uh, greater transparency, greater human rights uh, protection. The Crown Prince has denied any involvement in Khashoggi's death, but the Kingdom did prosecute some of the hitmen. Many human rights groups say it's now time for Bin Salman to pay. The Crown Prince needs to face accountability. He needs to face sanctions asset freezes, travel bans, and to let him go unpunished would be unconscionable. But it's a delicate balance for President Biden, who sees Saudi Arabia as a key ally in a volatile region. While running for president, Biden said he would take a hard line against Saudi leaders. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. For now, the White House will only say it's recalibrating its relationship with Saudi Arabia, while calls are growing louder, especially among Democrats, for President Biden to hold the crown prince accountable for the horrific crime. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. In his first public appearance since losing office, Donald Trump spoke at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Orlando, Florida, the largest annual gathering of Republicans and supporters. Trump made it clear he will remain the dominant force within the Republican Party. There's never been a journey so successful. We began it together four years ago, and it is far from being over. We've just started. We're not starting new parties. Let there be no doubt. We will be victorious and America will be stronger and greater than ever before. Trump has been holding court in Florida since leaving the White House and is positioning himself to play a major role in the 2022 midterm elections. Now to the water crisis impacting First Nations in Canada, an organization representing 34 First Nations in Manitoba is calling for an inquiry into how the federal government reviews major infrastructure projects. A joint investigation that includes Global News has been examining how outdated policies have forced many First Nations to cope on their own. Krista Hesse reports. 
The Southern Chiefs Organization says federal officials often force First Nations to work with substandard firms in order to save money, especially on key water projects. Now the group representing Anishinaabe and Dakota First Nations in Manitoba wants an inquiry. They're getting away with this because when they screw up on their, 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 their uh, projects, uh, there's no consequences for that. The government isn't penalizing. This comes after a joint investigation by Global News, APTN News, and the Institute for Investigative Journalism. It found a number of examples of First Nations who said the government forced them to select the lowest bidding contractor for their water projects. As a result, many said they were forced to deal with shoddy work, delays, cost overruns, and racism. It sure isn't in the interest of the taxpayer. It's not in the interest of the First Nation. And if it's going to continue, then, you know, uh, just be prepared to, to realize that uh, we're going to be wasting money here. The chiefs also say that navigating through federal bureaucracy can be a nightmare. The fact is that until First Nations are in control of their own futures, as it relates to planning around water and just infrastructure overall, whether it's housing, school systems, recreational facilities, you're not going to get a return on investment that you should. All infrastructure the Southern Chiefs Organization proposed its own regional water authority, but says federal officials have not offered them much support. We don't even have the funding in the bank yet. We have on paper, we are committed to working with you. That's what we have. That there are project plans. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller disputes evidence and testimony uncovered by Global News and its partners about the harm caused by the department's low bid policy. There is a value for money proposition in any procurement process that follows best industry practices, but this isn't about going with the cheap option. Uh, it's going with the option that suits the First Nation. At the same time, the minister admits federal policies are rooted in racism and need to be changed, but he doesn't know how long this will take. Krista Hesse, Global News. After a week that saw the newly installed Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Art McDonald, step aside while military police investigate allegations of misconduct, our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson sat down with Major Kelly Brennan for a follow-up interview after she sounded the alarm about the barriers complainants of sexual misconduct face in Canada's military. Kelly, some people are wondering whether the military can solve this internally. Do you think that's possible? I don't. I don't think it I don't think that the military can solve this problem. It's not a military problem. It's a personnel problem. In that I mean that it, it, this exists in society, this dis exists in other businesses, but it's just more pronounced in the military because we live amongst each other, because we, of the close contact we have, because one of our founding uh, raison d'etre for, for, for officers is know your, know your soldiers, so you know everything about them. I think that maybe we're just too close to solve it ourselves and that we have to take that, that uh, step back and, and let somebody else take over and create that lasting change. Major Brennan also told Mercedes that she wants Canadians to believe in the military and she is confident that the Canadian Armed Forces will be able to overcome this dark chapter. Canada's embassy in Yangon is condemning the violence in Myanmar, calling it appalling. That country witnessed its bloodiest day since the military coup sparked nationwide demonstrations. In the latest crackdown on protesters, security forces killed at least 18 people. Dozens more were wounded. A UN human rights representative on the ground says the protests had been peaceful, until the police moved in. Throughout the weekend, there have been mass arrests across Myanmar. Protesters are demanding the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi be restored to power. Coming up, the rise in booze sales and increasing health concerns.
Dry February is coming to an end tonight. The Canadian Cancer Society's campaign asks people to stop drinking for a month to reduce the risk of cancer. But the pandemic has spiked levels of anxiety, depression and loneliness. So more Canadians are turning to alcohol as a coping mechanism. As Caitlin Wilson reports, that's boosted the business of booze. When the uh, pandemic first hit, we were quite worried just as everybody else was. With alcohol deemed an essential service, financial worries quickly eased for Saskatchewan liquor store owner Philip McCallery as sales started to soar. It was dramatic. Within the first couple of months, McCallery says sales shot up 40% and deliveries increased threefold. Since then, he says both have remained steady. It wasn't a shock because people are stuck at home, not, not being able to do anything. According to the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, since the pandemic began, 25% of Canadians between 35 and 54 say they're drinking more, pointing to factors such as stress, boredom and lack of a regular schedule. We're certainly seeing increases in the number of people requiring admission for alcohol withdrawal. And these are people coming from across the socioeconomic spectrum. Mental health and addictions expert Peter Butt says increased access to alcohol combined with social isolation and anxiety is leading to unintended consequences. People that were perhaps episodic drinkers have become daily drinkers if every day is a Friday or a Saturday. And then it gets to a level where it can shift to the point that they're drinking to avoid withdrawal. And you don't have to look far to see how accessible alcohol has become. In Alberta, Willow Park Wine and Spirits says when the pandemic hit, it shifted primarily to e-commerce and delivery. We went from having uh, five deliveries a day in Alberta to 200. But experts worry the hangover from the alcohol boom could linger long after the pandemic has ended. Caitlin Wilson, Global News, Regina. Still ahead after a year of the pandemic's financial woes, are you ready for tax season? Nearly 9 million Canadians received COVID-19 relief benefits last year, including the CERB. That all has to be calculated on tax returns. Plus, there are new tax benefits for people who were forced to work from home. As Mike LeCouture reports, this tax season is a complicated one. 15 and 16, Bobby, I've got to send, right? Dennis Amyot hasn't filed his taxes in five years. Complicating things? He drew on the Kennedy Emergency Response Benefit in 2020, and he's trying to recoup years of unclaimed federal child benefits. It was, it was, it was a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Between my girls, for my girls' sake. They were, they, were, they were on my case to get it done. That's why he decided to get help at this free community tax clinic. But even the pros admit this year won't be easy. This is one of the most confusing seasons I've been a part of. Lisa Giddings of H&R Block says the different benefits claimed by Canadians will make it more complicated, especially since the CERB wasn't taxed at the source, but other government programs like the Canada Recovery Benefit were. That's why she suggests people remember one rule. With all of these benefits, any federal benefits received, expect to have some tax owing on your return. It was not free money. Now, the government is allowing you to claim $2 for each day of the pandemic that you had to work from home, up to $400. Or you can claim other expenses like your phone and internet bill. Sarah Jane Martin has worked from home for years and says you need to keep all of your receipts. I'm not a numbers person, so just having one color for monthly expenses and then another just for one-offs that pop up every once in a while. If you have any questions, you can always call the Canada Revenue Agency, which has seen a surge in calls. We've seen an 83% increase in call volume. The parliamentary secretary to the revenue minister says a third-party company is helping to answer some of those basic questions while they hire 2,000 more agents. And to relieve some of the stress, CRA has an interest relief program. If you owe money to the Canada Revenue Agency because you've collected certain benefit programs, that there will be no penalties, no interest on those funds that you owe until April of 2022. 
Now, that only applies if you've collected from a benefit program. But if you didn't and still owe money, that's due April 30th of this year. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Up next, the distracted doctor bouncing between the courtroom and the operating room. So, uh, can everybody... Are you uh, available for trial? It, it kind of looks like you're in an operating room right now. <laughs> I am, sir. I'm in an operating room. Yes, I'm available for trial. Go right ahead. Okay. A plastic surgeon in California insisted on attending a virtual court hearing to fight a traffic ticket while operating on a patient. This video captured by the Sacramento Bee shows Dr. Scott Green performing surgery while waiting for the judge, but the judge was not amused. So unless I'm mistaken, I'm seeing a defendant that's in the middle of an operating room appearing to be actively engaged in providing services to a patient. Is that correct, Mr. Green? Yes, sir. Or what I, should I say, Dr. Green? The judge didn't think it was appropriate and postponed the trial. But now the Medical Board of California is investigating the incident. And U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has made a call deep into space. The history making that you are doing, we are so proud of you. It is great to talk to you. Welcome to the International Space Station. NASA just posted last week's virtual chat between the vice president and Victor Glover for Black History Month. Glover is the first black crew member living on the space station. The 44-year-old arrived in November and just completed his third spacewalk. Today, Glover and fellow astronaut Kate Rubens worked over seven hours on upgrades to the lab's solar power system. And from the darkness of outer space, we leave you tonight with some down-to-earth inspiration for your next snow fort. 11-year-old Sebastian McCarthy from Lloydminster, Alberta, spent two months completing this impressive build. At times, he braved temperatures that dipped to minus 53. Thanks for watching. Good night.